because we're oh yeah so um, uh, uh, right finally settled so um, uh, right so I guess I prepared this talk for slightly uh, more basic with slightly more basic. I'll quickly pass through them and like focus on more important stuff later so for this audience I think a lot of the things are clear like the motivations sort of this is like uh, our motivations like we uh, receive requests from like a lot of these blockchain gaming clients you know loot boxes lotteries NFT crafting uh, I mean, they have their own use cases, and there is a very nice blog by Chainlink where sort of they describe all sorts of use cases here. Uh, and overall, the idea is sort of all these uh, uh, on-chain games they try to generate randomness on a smart contract, right? Uh, so how to uh, generate? Uh, how do smart contracts uh, get good randomness? Uh, you know, this is like again like very sort of uh, cliche slide with uh, you know unbiasable already been spoken about. Uh, unpredictable, publicly verifiable is pretty pretty standard stuff. Uh, and if you try to use again, this is like very basic slide. So uh, uh, just try to use something like a PRF. I mean, it's the obvious problem is you have the secret key exposed on chain. And uh, I mean, it's slightly surprising that it still satisfies these two properties, but not unpredictability, right? Because the secret key is exposed. So. Uh, and it uh, seems to be a huge problem storing secrets uh, on chain. So uh, we go for like a more sophisticated solution where we generate randomness off chain, and here comes the whole sort of story of you know DVR. So this is basically introduction of how why DVRF sort of comes into play in smart contract based you know uh, randomness generation, right? Uh, okay, so verifiable random functions. Uh, we have uh, we need unbiasability where uh, the output cannot be biased. Unpredictability again, very very cliche slides, uh, hard to predict uh, without uh, the knowledge of the secret key. And then there is public verifiability, which is like slightly more tricky. Now we have to generate some sort of a zero knowledge proof, uh, which will verify a input output pair x and y. Right, so uh, why we go for a distributed solution? So because we uh, offer a distributed VRF service, or threshold VRF, I think Bernardo also mentioned in the last slide, uh, because of single point of failure, right? So if you have only one node storing the secret key, uh, it becomes a single point of failure. It doesn't, I mean, it has uh, other problem. Also, it's sort of not really good from the ethos of blockchain technology, right? It has to be decentralized, you know, that's sort of the whole uh, technology is all about, right? So distributed VRF, secret key, secret shared in a threshold fashion, like T out of N, uh, and usually using a distributed key generation. Talk more about it. Uh, any T plus one nodes can collaborate and can compute the output, and it should uh, tolerate un up to T malicious corruptions. Right? Uh, it's pretty much uh, the standard stuff again. Uh, so again, like so, DKG is not the focus of this talk, but just to mention that uh, at Supra we actually tried to look into various DKG protocols. I think uh, uh, some of them already been mentioned uh, in in this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, however, actually, you know, just a uh, couple of days back, or maybe yesterday, we got this uh, new thing that uh, we have that. Uh, Non-interactive VSS uh, using class groups, and uh, based on that, we have a new DKG protocol. It's like completely non-interactive and publicly verifiable, right? So it's. Uh, I mean, maybe let me spend some uh, more time uh, on this. So it's basically uh, there is this whole uh, sort of literature of publicly verifiable secret sharing. You basically publish uh, encryption and associated proof, and if you try to do it efficiently with Elgamal. Uh, the main problem with the prior approaches, which are not class group based, was you cannot encrypt like large data, right? Yeah, so I was talking about class groups DKG, so the, uh, it's kind of similar to uh, the standard publicly verifiable secret sharing and then providing sort of a zero knowledge proof of correct secret sharing. So if you use standard Ilgamal schemes, the problem with Ilgamal is basically if you want to encrypt in the exponent, Unless it's very, very small, you cannot really efficiently decrypt it. Right? That's been a standard problem for Ilgamal. And uh, class group is, are basically has this amazing structure that, that they can enable this. They have this sort of subgroup structure inside which enables this efficient decryption. And this becomes like extremely simple. So this is like a sort of preliminary paper. It doesn't have like very rigorous uh, proofs or something. We're working on these things. But I definitely encourage you to take a look here if you're interested in DKG uh, literature, right? 
Okay, so now what's the setting? You know, there, there is this guy who is holding this input x, and uh, every node uh, holding a, after the, uh, the, the, the DKG, everyone has a share of a secret key, and then they output these partial evaluations. The, uh, they are being aggregated publicly. In this case, is n is equal to three and t is equal to one. So you know, t is equal to one means you need two guys. Like t plus one is the threshold, right? And it should tolerate up to uh, one corruptions because we are in the uh, honest majority setting. I'll just explain why honest majority is important. So you know, uh, VRF requirements are there, and additionally, for the maybe this is the new things that hasn't been really spoken about in this workshop. So maybe spend more time here. So it requires some uh, new uh, guarantees like consistency. That means participating set doesn't matter. Like it's similar to threshold signature, whichever sets are participating, any T plus one would produce the same output. Strong pseudo random. This is actually a very important property that now that we have corruptions involved, the pseudo randomness should hold even if there are up to t malicious corruption. And that becomes kind of a Im important property uh, it to prove, actually. And then robustness is, again, another important property that if aggregation succeeds, verification must also succeed. So why this is important, you know, this kind of boils down to the fact that each of these partial values you should be able to verify immediately. Because let's say you receive like, I don't know, like uh, if your threshold is 10 and you receive like 20 values, you do not know which of them are actually correct, right? You cannot take like this all 20 choose 10 combinations. You rather verify each of them and maybe there are like up to 10 of them are corrupt, right? Uh, so you should discard all these bad values. You choose only the good values. And once you aggregate correctly, then you publish the verification should work. See, it's kind of not desirable if later the verification fails after aggregation, right? So robustness is important. And then liveness is like execution must, or it's kind of a guaranteed output delivery situation. And for this to hold, we need this uh, sort of honest majority that threshold cannot cross, uh, cannot touch actually in over two, right? Now, guaranteed out del output delivery is impossible without robustness just because of the fact that you can just aggregation can choose you know wrong values and then after like uh, reconstruction or like aggregation you will see it's actually invalid signature but it's not detected so you need to detect everything immediately right uh, so the it boils down to the fact that you need honest majority plus you need this robustness to achieve liveness guarantee so that's these are like sort of new important properties Okay, so our constructions are basically, we have a base construction and we have more advanced constructions. So our base construction is basically the glow construction, which is also probably the Durand construction. It's very similar. Maybe there are some differences. Uh, so the DKG, actually, we are looking into, we are taking the class group DKG. It's not immediately in place, but we are working towards the deployment there, the class group based DKG that we're going to use. And... Uh, this part is like basically a BLS partial signing protocol, like zero hashing and raising to the power of partial key. And then for partial verification or robustness, you also generate this zero knowledge proof of correctness, uh, which is basically a Chom Peterson proof of uh, you know equality of exponent there, right? And the aggregation, you verify each of the zero knowledge proof, right? And if they passes only. And because there is an honest majority guarantee, and if everybody replies, I'm assuming that everybody replies and there is sort of no network fault at this point right now, and then you will be able to sort of derive a correct value z after you know this uh, fancy Lagrange interpolation in the exponent, and the hash of it is basically the VRF output. Verification, simple, like BLS verification plus the uh, hashing, right? It's, that's basically the overall constructions. So a couple of points here is that the zero knowledge proof actually is sort of uh, already in the GLOW paper that there are two options that you can do for this partial verification, that you do not attach zero knowledge proof and use BLS partial verification as well. Uh, and uh, if I, I remember correctly, I'm not sure what DRAN, but the Definity Randomness Bacon was actually not using zero knowledge proof. So what happens if you do not have zero knowledge proof? So you lose in two fronts. So in other words, if you use the knowledge proof, there are like win-win situations. So you win in the strong pseudo-randomness. You can prove things are strong pseudo-random. 
Intuitively, why? Because zero-knowledge proofs are simulatable, right? And the pairing verification are, does not support simulatability, right? So that's quite crucial here. Plus, you have these, uh, since you are not doing in pairing group, the, this uh, aggregation part, right? You are gaining in some sort of, you know, 2.5x. That's kind of approximately you are gain, gaining in the computation. And that's sort of the already that was discovered in Glow and, uh, you know, sort of they showed that why this proof fails and so on, right? Uh, again, so I just already mentioned this, that this step ensures robustness. So now let's see like how the framework works actually. Uh, so the VR framework that we thought about is like, you know, there is a requester or who is sort of, let's say there is a, you know, game file organization which is uh, sort of, which is uh, asking for a randomness uh, request, which is making randomness request in the smart contract. And the smart contract actually generates the input. I mean, more on this input part I'll discuss later. It's kind of tricky how to generate this input, and it's like kind of a work in progress. And there is a relay from the Supra side. We have these relay nodes, which are kind of free nodes, and they're constantly looking into a smart contract request, and they transfer these inputs uh, to the VRF committees, kind of sends to all the uh, nodes in the VRF committees, get the partial input evaluations back, uh, aggregates uh, can happen in relay, or maybe it can happen in VRF committee. Doesn't really matter, but it's for simplicity. We just uh, draw it. It happen in relay, and then uh, the output is sent back. Verification happens in the smart contract. So it's important part is that the randomness request itself is in the smart contract, and when it comes back, the why it must be verified at the smart contract. And from our discussions uh, with the clients, the gaming clients, they are really sort of uh, very stringent on the fact that verification must happen on chain, right? Uh, okay, so maybe this is a good point to sort of so far, uh, uh, we have been only mostly hearing about sort of randomness beacon service and here is the DVRF service. I think maybe so, sort of we have this also, I don't know, some question. I'm like not completely clear about these questions. Maybe, you know, if there's a question we can discuss afterwards. So in our minds, what is the difference between randomness beacon service versus VRF service is that randomness beacon user does not make a request. So it's not like on-demand service, right? So there is an input that's being generated, maybe in the smart contract, maybe some other way, it's just, but this part is surely not there. The user does not make a request. So there is a constant source of randomness that's being produced. Uh, apart from that, everything stays the same. So there is slightly, I mean, it can be slightly problematic, you know, ha can have some downside in the gaming context because sometimes you need to, you know, run, get several randomnesses as an output and can run them. So there is no basically user control, right? Okay, so there is no user control. And furthermore, uh, um, the synchronization is, can be problematic, right? So you have to sort of, let's say we agree, all of us like, you know, like there are like, 50 people are playing a game and we have to agree on, let's say at 12 a.m. whatever randomness will be output will play then. And then there may be some faults and synchronization can be slightly problematic, right? Again, like I'm not an expert in like, you know, game five or this kind of thing. So, you know, if you have a comments, I'm welcome to, uh, you are welcome to sort of, you know, uh, the discussion. Okay, so, uh, so the first version, the basic version, what we have now, let's talk about the, how do you produce the input? Okay, so input is again, we came up with like bunch of stuff that should be in the input and uh, after a lot of discussions are engineers and this is like kind of completely open uh, area and sort of we, I was discussing with Aniket and I said like, this is a good audience to sort of, you know, put it there so that there should be some discussions on this and maybe there should be some standardized format of input uh, or some some other things, right? Uh, so, you know, just whatever, right now we have some stuff that kind of you can expect like what you put in, like there is a user input because of more user control, there is a user input field, unique nonce each time, you know, you generate unique nonce can be a counter even, right? Chain ID, that means sort of, you know, whichever smart contract, if it's in a Polygon or Ethereum, it should like take that into account. User ID is specific to a user, and user can have multiple functions, so callback function name or ID. And finally, there is block hash, which is like, we are slightly skeptical whether it should be there or not. So traditionally, before all this VRF service, people used to use block hash as a source of, main source of randomness. And I guess like a lot of people knows, but still let me reiterate that if you use block hash, 
it can be really problematic. I think there are actually some real world attacks. Maybe you guys know better than me. But uh, if you use block hash, uh, the miner can know block hash ahead of everyone else. So the unpredictability aspect is really weak there, right? So now in this context, whether should we have block hash or not, this is like kind of, uh, I personally think that it might be uh, dispensed of, but not, not sure actually. Uh, okay, so now actually let me talk about an issue with this basic service that we found and that's sort of our motivation to sort of ha add more features to it, right? So in the basic service what we have is that the output is exposed immediately. So I make a request and immediately the output comes into the, you know, it becomes public basically and it comes on chain, right? So uh, one issue with that is that it cannot be made in advance, right? Let's say I, I want to use like an hour from now, if I say that, okay, now sort of I want to do it, like maybe there will be some other computational overhead at time or something, cannot be made in advance, right? So I have to like do it uh, right at that time, right? And wait for like there is some network delays and some synchronization issues as well. And then there is some sort of a reusability issues. So by reusability, what I mean is kind of a very simple thing. You use the output y as a seed to generate like further randomnesses and I think uh, uh, if d as per my discussion with the engineers I cur currently Chainlink VRF service actually offers that but you have to use all of these things like at the same time because once y is known this there is no unpredictability left the entire unpredictable entire thing is predictable right so it cannot be really reused later right so with this problem sort of uh, in mind, what we proposed is a different, like slightly upgraded service with output privacy, right? So what I've output privacy means is user makes a request. It's like very minor changes in the overall architecture. And the smart contract, the input is being generated after user request, and the input is now sent back to the user. When the user sends a blinded input, X prime, and note that both X and X prime are already visible to everyone, right? And the smart contract, right? They're public. So the purpose of blinding is not to hide the input, but to hide the output. Now, after blinding, what happens is basically the entire operation, whatever I showed in the previous slide, stays exactly the same. So whatever was happening before, now again it's happening, but now with respect to the blinding input. So the entire VRF is being computed with respect to X prime, and there is then there is Y prime being generated, and verification on chain can be done uh, with respect to X prime and Y prime. Now Y prime is completely blinded, right? Uh, and uh, nobody has any clue what the underlying Y is except the user. So user has randomness, and which is kind of a blinder, and after uh, it's being sent to the user. Uh, actually, there should be a one more step of unblinding. The user can unblind it, and after that, it can basically send to the chain and can be verified and so on. Now, it can be made in advance, of course, because it stays blinded, the entire thing, right? Hidden. And it can be reusable, but there is a catch here that the verification must be delayed. Why this is true? So, how we want to reuse it as a seed that you can hash. Uh, y with like this 1, 2, and so on to generate the Z1, Z2. Now, to verify Z1 with respect to a request X, right, you have to know Y. And once you know Y, you also know Z2, Z3, and everything. So if, if I am giving, say, if I have like Z1 and Z2 together, once I reveal the proof for Z1, I have to, there is no unpredictability left for Z2. Right? So there is some advantage in gaining, so we can just make one request and after that we can generate multiple things, but the verification cannot be done until I'm sort of, this round of uh, requests are exhausted. So if I'm, I, I can use them like in several rounds of like say, you know, NFT crafting or sort of this reward based gaming where you allocate reward at each round of games. But after let's say 10 minutes, I reveal that, okay, here are the 10 different randomnesses I use, now you verify. So for, for these 10 rounds, sort of you have to believe me that I'm doing it correctly. I mean, it can be sort of mitigated by using some staking mechanism and so on. That's kind of, again, a toss up right now. But that's sort of overall the idea, uh, I mean, from the architectural perspective. 
There is another catch here is that requester knows ahead of time, right? So in applications where the requester can benefit from knowing the randomness ahead of time, it can be problematic, right? Especially, for example, if there is some baiting going on, like people are, so I just wanted to say that if there is some sort of a baiting event going on that, you know, the different players are baiting and uh, the house will allocate with like, let's say, the, for the correct bait or something, right? For this kind of events, uh, this kind of games, it becomes a bit problematic because I can sort of put my dummy player and can have the request ahead of time and ask this guy to sort of say that, okay, just raise, it. I get number 10, so you just say 10 and I can always make my favorite player win. But for uh, sort of gaming context where you sort of, uh, you know, allocate these like loot boxes or like, you know, some NFT you are sort of awarding in its game, this might not be possible. Or if there is no collusion between the house and any of the games, right? So there are multiple games. So you have to be application specific. Uh, we plan to like really uh, sort of uh, have a documentation of all these things and uh, the sort of user's guide manual kind of for this kind of service. But that's the state of art. Okay, now it's gone again, but I mean, this works, uh, that's already good. Okay, good, so uh, where am I? Okay, here. Good, so, you know, so let me just briefly talk about how to achieve this sort of output privacy. I mean, from the construction perspective, it's kind of uh, not, not that hard. I mean, there are like a few more added algorithms. There is a blinding algorithm. Uh, one crucial thing here is that the blinding should come with a zero knowledge proof as well. Because if I sort of send you something which is malformed, right, the security can be messed up a little bit. And this is like slightly from a provable perspective. If I, you know, it happens is that, you know, why do you use HX to the K? Like wh what's the use of random oracle here, right? Why do you consider random oracle? Because I want to make sure that H of X maps to a random group element for which I do not know the discrete log. These kind of things becomes important in the proof, right? So the, the provable security guarantee, we need to make sure this is a correctly formatted blinded pair, X and X prime. For that, we can just attach a Schnorr proof here uh, that's basically, you know, proof of correct binding, and that's being checked at the, and the aggregation can stay exactly the same, like I mentioned, that apart from the blinding and unblinding part, I think this is the, like, more interesting part, actually, it should be, okay, so, just, I wanted to say that the blinding factor and uh, the user needs to keep the state. So the blinding factor is needed for unblinding as well. And if you are familiar with sort of, uh, you know, like just quickly doing that, you know, so that this doesn't happen again. So just putting it there, right? So if you are familiar with like oblivious PRF uh, construction, this is very similar to oblivious PRF, but note that we are not trying to hide any input here. The oblivious PRF is all about hiding inputs. And here we are blinding, but the goal is to always hide the output, right? So the construction is very simple, like choose a random blinding and you know, just hash it and raise to the power of that blind, it becomes sort of a completely random group element and everything now stays in a sort of, because of sort of homomorphism in the exponent, some sort of linear homomorphism going on, it's basically happening like the, you know, BLS signature or whatever can happen, right? So it's very similar to threshold BLS or oblivious fair if like, you know, nothing very fancy, but the, Setting is slightly different, I, I told you. That's why uh, we need to be careful, at least in the proof, we need to propose a new sort of uh, modeling and then, yeah, so I just wanted to say that the construction is very similar, but there are subtle differences and we need to rely on sort of one more type of assumptions because of this, if you want to reduce, which is different from BLS, where it's standard kind of bilinear uh, CDH kind of assumption already works. So it's slightly different here, right? Yeah, so basically we want to merge these two service so that there will be like P or NP, not the usual PNP question, but P stands for private and NP stands for non-private. So the user can, on demand, it can make different requests, like either private or non-private. And based on that, we have the dashed line, so you know, the smart contract should be designed so that it will just send back for the private request or you know, just wait for the relay to capture this for the non-private request. And the other stuff are basically staying the same. I mean, there will be some engineering or discussion that should go on there. Uh, there is an attack actually with this, like, you know, kind of a framework type of attack that can happen if the relay is corrupt or someone who is looking into the smart contract 
because note that the input is already public. So how do you know it's a private or non-private, right? Like let's say there's a private request, but relay or some, you know, someone just ask, make sure that the relay makes a non-private request. So then the output is immediately public, right? So there could be like other way we can sort of uh, prevent against this attack, like this output recovery attack for uh, this March service. But whatever we thought about, like change the input the input uh, format to sort of include this flag, and you can just use the adjust this flag to like switch to one or zero, and make sure that the entire input space of the private and non-private are completely different. That makes the things uh, kind of uh, go on correctly. Uh, so we are doing this, I mean, we are putting this privacy aspect and whatnot, but uh, the question is who cares? Uh, I mean, so, I mean, we have these ongoing discussions that we are talking to this uh, particular gaming service that, uh, well, like, our more applied people are talking to them. I, mean, I was just listening to the meetings mostly, but DeFi Kingdoms, uh, they're basically a on-chain gaming uh, platform and they were not using VRF because of high gas cost. And uh, for each time they have to sort of get this thing and you know there will be gas cost associated with it. And uh, they were not happy about the fact uh, that what Chainlink was offering that you can just hash them but you have to use them together. So what we offered with this privacy, uh, sort of output privacy is that you can make it more efficient, that you can just get one seed and can keep it hidden until let's say next 10 shots and they are pretty excited about it. So, you know, we have a client for this actually. That's kind of important in the startup setting. Uh, okay, so i just uh, summarizing. Uh, so basic idea is basically using Glow and we have a new DKG protocol. I uh, ask all of you to take a look. It, it in the, uh, it, it's in the uh, e-print, but it's not super formal right now. We'll make it more formal. Uh, we have this output privacy part, we call it FlexiRand. I forgot to like, uh, mention that cool name that we invented. So FlexiRand is actually a conditional accept at CCS23 right now. Uh, well, you know. And uh, then uh, the big open question that sort of, I want to put as a, as a sort of, you know, so that the community should look into more is the, it, it's very pertinent to the VRF setting. It doesn't come up in the randomness bacon setting. If I understand randomness bacon service correctly. The randomness bacon is basically the input really doesn't matter because it's controlled by the environment. But here it's generating a smart contract, it's user influence, so there it becomes really problematic that what kind of input formatting and if we change the input formatting, maybe there are attacks or, or something from the framework side, even if not from the VRF computation side, right? Uh, so with that, I sort of uh, uh, conclude my talk this is the QR code. If you scan it, you will actually see that web page. Uh, so thank you if you have any questions. Um, as usual, with social uh, networking like this, uh, I have one question. What is the governance of the nodes that runs this VRF? Sorry, I didn't get what? Like, how do you manage uh, governance and membership of? No okay, that's a, that's yeah. a good it's, point. So it's right the now, same question, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, so that's a good point. So right now, I mean, we are actually we're sort of launching the mainnet alpha soon. soon. Right now, whatever being deployed is basically they're all nodes are internal and they're sort of kind of geo distributed over three continents. We have nine nodes actually right now <laughs> that I know. This is like very experimental setup right now. So whatever happens is at some point they will probably go for like hundred nodes or something. That's the plan overall. But the governance part, I think, yeah, you're right, it's still being figured out. Right now it's being sort of manual in some sense. It's not really very automated. It's, there is the scaling and all these things needs to be done, yeah. But yeah, I mean, be curious to know, I mean, how this is done in like DRAN or maybe other services. Thanks for the talk. You did a nice job of explaining several circumstances in which the, this might fail. I was curious <clears throat> if those are theoretical or if you actually had any sort of, uh, you know, hacks in the past or, or any breakages. Hacks. No, I mean, our, this thing is actually, you know, not, I mean, the full-scale deployment is still underway. So we do not have really experienced with this user experience. So, you know, maybe one year from now, you ask me the question, I can answer better. But these are all sort of, you know, whatever the speculation or theoretical thinking that, you know, this might happen or this might occur. And some of them actually came off from the discussion with these clients, potential clients, uh, and so on, yeah.
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you.